Hello once again, my name is Andre Gagne. Welcome to my YouTube channel. So this week I will be continuing the series I started a couple of weeks back on apostolic centers. Uh, my first two clips were about explaining what they were and uh, the last clip was about features and purposes of apostolic centers. Now, today I'm going to be uh, discussing what is called apostolic alignment. This is a feature and this is a purpose that one finds uh, uh, in these apostolic centers. It is a common expression that is found amongst New Apostolic Reformation leaders. Uh, you will find this expression in their literature. Um, I've shown you, I showed you a couple of books last week um, from their primary sources. There are additional books that are very interesting, uh, very modern, uh, very up-to-date, I should say, um, book uh, that was re uh, really recently published, in fact, this year, uh, Modern Day Apostles by uh, Che An, uh, which gives a lot of information uh, about the idea of apostles, about the idea of an alignment, um, about the idea of ap apostolic centers, apostolic fe uh, spheres. There's also the work of C. Peter Wagner. He's been talking about that for many, many years. Uh, so apostles today and apostles and prophets are very, very good sources to have a sense of what all of this means. So apostolic alignment, what is it exactly? How is it practiced in the context of apostolic centers? Essentially apostolic uh, alignment is the recognition of what uh, new apostolic reformation leaders uh, understand to be the God-ordained government of the church. And this, there are several biblical passages that are used to kind of uh, justify their worldview and their understanding of what constitutes the government of the church. Uh, there are a couple of passages that we will read. I think it's important for us to have a sense of where this comes from. Uh, you can see it on your screen. Uh, there's a first text, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's an epistle uh, by uh, the Apostle Peter, chapter 12, verse 28. It's in the context of what is called the spiritual gifts. Uh, it says, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations or government, uh, various kinds of tongues. So that's one uh, important text where the mention of apostles is uh, at the beginning of the list. So apostles are very, very important in the mind of Paul, at least how he conceptualizes the idea of the spiritual gifts. Uh, there's also another very interesting passage. It's in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, the writer of Ephesians uh, in verses 19 and 20 will also talk about apostles as being foundational. So it says in verse 19 and 20 of that second chapter, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone cornerstone, sorry. So uh, what we have here is that uh, the writer of Ephesians says that uh, the church itself is built on the ministry of apostles and prophets. So they are foundational to the building up of the church. And he will develop this idea of the building up of the church later on, a couple of chapters later, in Ephesians 4 and we will read it because this is where this idea of apostolic alignment comes from. Uh, they have a particular concept and they develop this starting from mainly Ephesians chapter 4. We've read it uh, several times in the past but we'll go back to it because it's, it's important to understand this idea. So in chapter 4 verses 11 and 12 as you see on your screen it says, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ. So what's 
interesting here, and if you read the literature and you watch the videos of several New Apostolic Reformation leaders, they will tell you that here there is an important concept of alignment which they associate to the idea of equipping. Now, a lot of them say that this comes from a Greek verb, katartizo, uh, to, to, to say that it is, it corresponds to their idea of alignment. They're, they're going to talk about a medical term, which means to put things together. Um, now, we need to be careful. In the Greek text, it's not the verb that is used. It's actually a noun. So uh, you see it on uh, your screen. I'm, I'm putting the verse back there so that you can have a sense of it. Uh, it's proston katartismon ton Hagion. Eh? So ton katartismon is the, uh, the noun. Eh? So it's ho katartismos. So it's essentially what it means. That noun means the equipment. Eh? Um, so it's, it's a noun. And it's, you, have the, you have the preposition pros, which governs the ac accusative. So the noun is in the accusative case here. But it's, it's clear that it's not a verb. So, uh, so when they talk about the verb, it's not really that. Um, it's not the action. It's essentially the consequence. Eh? It's the result. So uh, he gave these ministries as a consequence for the equipment of the, uh, the body of Christ. Eh? For the equipping or the equipment uh, or for the perfection. Uh, perfecting uh, the body of Christ. So uh, this is important um, because sometimes they lack a little precision when it comes to explaining some of those ideas. The word does not necessarily mean alignment here. So this is, this is important to, to note. They also often make a reference to a passage from the Hebrew Bible and they refer to uh, the translation uh, in the Septuagint, which is the, cre the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, uh, they will quote, uh, of course, the, the, uh, a tra an English translation, but they're going to refer again to this verb, katartizo. Eh? Um, when they talk about that verse, it's the story, it's actually uh, a vision uh, where uh, it's in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 37. It's the vision or the, the vision of the valley of the dry bones, and God ordains. Um, Ezekiel to prophesy on these dry bones so that they can, so that life can get back into them and they can come together and form a, an army. Uh, it, it is the army of God in that, in that context. And, and people like C. Peter Wagner and others that talk about uh, apostolic alignment will use that reference as a way to explain that you see alignment, katartizo, is to to put together, uh, align, it's, it's align people like these bones so that they can form an army. Now, when you read the text, we can, we can read it. Uh, you see it on your screen now, Ezekiel 37.7. Uh, um, I have it here in an English translation. So I prophesied and I was as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and behold, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And then together they, f they formed an army, uh, if you continue reading. But the word, even in the Greek text, there's no word that re really refers to that verb. Um, the idea of coming together, especially the word together, is uh, harmonia. Huh? So it's, it, it means harmony. So the idea is these bones harmonize themselves to form eventually uh, an, an army that will stand and be the army of God. And uh, of course, this is a kind of analogy for this idea of apostolic alignment. So in the end, katartismos is a bit of a stretch to use as a concept of alignment, but we can understand where they're coming from. It's, it's important for us to understand that uh, they're using certain ideas. They're not always precise because uh, when you look at the Greek text, it's not really that, but it's the idea of equipment. Eh? So in a sense, what they really mean is that 
people need to align themselves to apostles to be equipped. So if people align themselves to apostles, uh, to specific individuals uh, that have a ministry uh, to, to train, to perfect the church, then they, in a sense, will be perfected um, and they will accomplish uh, their, their mandate as individuals, as, as members of the body of Christ. So uh, alignment essentially is uh, to, you know, when people talk about alignment, uh, and, and you could read it in their books, they try to explain this concept practically what it means. Uh, it's when an individual identifies a particular apostle and enters into some kind of covenantal relationship, a committed relationship that, that requires some kind of a, accountability on the part of the, uh, the person that, that kind of lends its, himself or puts himself under the guidance and the supervision and the shepherding, in a sense, of an apostle. Um, it's an accountability relationship. It's a kind of, and, and sometimes it's even described in terms of father-son relationship, eh? where uh, it's, it's voluntarily submitting oneself to someone that has a certain authority over you so that you can grow. Now, it's, it's, and it's an interesting idea, but it, it sometimes resonates a bit with the shepherding movement that had a lot of problems, as we know, uh, in the 80s and eventually was dismantled because people felt that they were under the dictatorship of <laughs> individuals that were over them. Um, and they couldn't make decisions, they didn't, and they, they couldn't, uh, you know, live their lives without, uh, without being under the scrutiny of these shepherds that were over them. So it's a, it's a kind of a new way to talk about that but in a more kind of acceptable form. But in the end, it's still a kind of a submission that someone uh, yields to another, right? It's, it's someone yields their, their, his or her own authority and, 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 and comes under the authority of um, a certain apostle that he recognizes as you know, someone worthy to follow. Now, according to the New Apostolic Reformation uh, writers, there are many types of apostles. Uh, when we read the New Testament our, in our minds, the apostles are the 12 apostles, or sometimes you can have Paul, uh, but they go much further than that. And they, they kind of read the New Testament almost like a, a manual uh, by which they can shape their idea uh, their, their ideas around apostleship and, and their ideas of the government of the church. So it is a way, it is a manual, eh? uh, in a nutshell. So uh, there are various apostles, and I'm going to go through this very quickly just to, for you to have a sense of how it works and, how, uh, and, and to whom people are aligning themselves uh, with. So there, are, there is a, a first category, which is called vertical apostles. They, these vertical apostles are probably the most common apostles that we find. Uh, they lead churches, they lead uh, various ministry or parachurches, pra parachurch organizations. And under that, they, under this idea of vertical apostles, you, you have categories where it helps us to kind of identify the type of vertical apostle uh, someone is. Um, and these are categories that have been established pretty much uh, by uh, Peter Wagner himself. He talks about this, especially in this book, uh, Apostles Today. He, he kind of uh, lays out this, this foundational element. So uh, ver vertical apostles, uh, the first group or the first category would be ecclesiastical apostles. So one example in the New Testament of that would be Paul. Paul, the apostle Paul, would fall under that category. These are apostles that are given a certain sphere uh, where they lead a number of churches, uh, they lead ministries or organizations uh, and they give direction to those uh, ministries and, and, and direction. They're, they're, these ministries, these churches, 
put themselves almost like under the protection, under the covering of these apostles. So these apostles have certain authority. Let's say they are in charge of a group of church or they oversee, it's like the bishops, eh? uh, they oversee a certain number of churches. They have the authority uh, to speak into the lives of the pastors of those churches. So these pastors uh, submit themselves. It's, a, it, it's not a bureaucratic kind of denominational structure. It's more relational in its, in its purpose and in how it's functioning. But still, they, they do submit themselves. They do voluntarily put themselves under the covering of those apostles. And these apostles have the authority over them to speak in their lives and even to rebuke them if necessary. So if there are issues, these, uh, these pastors are accountable, they have a certain accountability towards uh, these, uh, these apostles. And this can be manifested in, in very practical ways. Like if a pastor enters into this kind of covenantal relationship with an apostle, um, he can, uh, and often this is, is kind of sealed that way, uh, provide for financially for the apostle. He might support the apostle that is, uh, uh, that is over him uh, with, with some kind of financial support, financial aid. Uh, this is how he shows, uh, a pastor would show the, you know, this, this alignment with this apostle. That's how he depends on him and how he appreciates, in a certain sense, the ministry of that individual. So you have these ecclesiastical apostles that are part of the vertical um, apostleship model. There's also apostolic team members where apostles themselves will uh, kind of surround themselves with members, various people. It could be a spouse, it could be, it could be a, a, a prophet, it could be an administrator, it could be someone that will support the apostle financially, uh, it could be close friends, it could be all sorts of individuals um, where uh, there's a team there. And, and often even the apostle himself will uh, kind of uh, work with that team and make sure that, that you know, a, a, a certain direction is given to a particular ministry uh, and in the apostle's own life. Huh? So he's going to sometimes work in consultation with that team. So there, it's a group of people that will kind of support, uh, it's a support system for the apostle himself. There are also functional apostles. This is the third category that falls under these, this vertical structure where um, a, a particular individual will provide leadership and authority to specific, um, uh, specific groups of people that are engaged in specific tasks. Um, these are not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, they, they won't be necessarily covering churches or specific individuals, but they will be in charge of certain functions. Let's say, uh, for example, people are engaged in spiritual warfare, uh, in warfare prayer, or in power evangelism. You will have certain types of apostles that will give leadership in to these types of functions. You see, uh, if it's prophets, you will have certain types of apostle prophets eh, that will give leadership and have a certain authority in that field, in that functionality. So uh, Wagner discerns that there are people that have more authority when it comes to certain functional elements. It could be economics. Uh, it could be prayer. It could be in the, in the, in the dimension of, of education. Eh? Uh, so it's very interesting when you think about that in terms of the seven mountain mandate. Eh? Uh, we'll come back to that at one point when we look at marketplace uh, apostles. But it's interesting uh, to see that there's functionalities and you have apostles that can lead according to functionalities. And the fourth category is um, under the, that vertical type of apostleship is congre congregational apostles. These are apostles that are tied to churches. Um, Wagner estimates that 
uh, pastors that manage to have their churches grow beyond seven or 800 people where they pass that mark, uh, they're more than just pastors. They have, they have certain abilities that pastors uh, don't necessarily have. It's not that pastors are not good, but it's just that these, these apostles have certain uh, leadership qualities that pastors might not have to reach that, that, that kind of mark uh, where you have individuals that will bring and lead uh, their own congregations to uh, higher numbers. So congregational apostles will be uh, these people that will lead their congregations past the seven or eight hundredth uh, in attendance, say that mark in attendance. But that's, that's one category. That's, of course, these are not, it's very hard in, empirically to verify all of this. Uh, there's, no, there's no biblical reference per se around these questions. These are observations. Uh, these are uh, things that Peter Wagner has, has come up with to kind of explain the various ways that apostles function in their various capacities. Now, vertical apostles are one thing. You also have horizontal apostleships um, where these people don't necessarily provide covering or personal accountability, but these people have the ability to kind of bring individuals together around common themes, common causes, uh, yeah, common projects. So you have convening apostles. So uh, you have several types of apostles there too. You have convening apostles. The example that is often given in the literature is the example of James, uh, the, uh, the, the leader of the church of, in Jerusalem. Uh, we read in the book of Acts, for example, in Acts chapter 15, that he managed to convene in Jerusalem uh, a bunch of leaders and apostles to discuss the issue that were uh, coming up with the inclusion of Gentiles in the Christian, the early Christian community. Um, so James had that leadership. Uh, so that's, that's what you find in, in the literature on uh, apostleship in uh, the New Apostolic Reformation ideas. Eh? Uh, so what, what this says is that uh, people that have this gift of apostleship, they work horizontally. They, they, they are influencers. They are, they, they are capable of, of bringing in people, joining in for specific, uh, specific projects and, and ideas and, and motivate people to, to uh, push forward for their ideas. So, uh, for example, there, these types of apostles will be involved in apostolic networks, right? Eh? Uh, and so on. So convening apostles is one thing. There's also apostles that serve as ambassadors um, where they have an, an itinerant ministry. Uh, they're not necessarily fixed in a, a, a particular place, but they go around and they kind of motivate individuals. They kind of uh, stimulate existing apostolic, uh, apostolic networks. Uh, you also have, which I think is a bit similar, uh, but they say these are different. You have not only uh, apostles as ambassadors, but uh, mobilizing apostles also. Now, mobilizing apostles, they also travel, uh, but according uh, to the literature that we can read on this, these mobilizing apostles, uh, they focus on a specific thing. So they differ in a sense because they focus on specific projects and causes. Uh, one of the examples that is given of someone that has this kind of apostolic ministry is uh, Cindy Jacobs, who is in charge of Generals International, which is a prayer movement, where she goes around and she essentially mobilizes what she calls generals into engaging with social transformation, engaging in trying to change and reform society. So she travels, but she has a particular project, which is around social transformation. 
And you also have, which is very interesting, this is a category in and of itself, um, territorial apostles. So under the horizontal uh, leadership is also territorial apostles. So these apostles function according to a geographical sphere, eh? a geographical territory. So they could be set over uh, cities, over certain regions, over uh, counties, it could be over states, it could be over nations, and so on, eh? geographical uh, locations. And you have uh, these individuals that are recognized in uh, these apostolic networks. For example, there, were, there, there are people in this literature that I read that uh, believe uh, that Bill Johnson, the pastor of Bethel at, at Reading, uh, would be the apostle of a, an entire region in North California. Uh, so he would, he would have that responsibility. He would be a territorial apostle over that region. And some people recognize that. Others would say, for example, uh, for the city of LA, uh, Los Angeles, others thought that Jack Hayford was the apostle of that city. So there are at one point individuals that start to be recognized as having a certain uh, authority over a region or a territory, and these are designated as uh, territorial apostles. Now, in that, in that sense also of those, those territorial apostles, there's a kind of a subcategory that is added to this group, uh, which is apostles according to ethnicity. Uh, certain ethnic groups, uh, uh, apostles that would, would kind of be over or be in charge or have authority over certain ethnic groups. Uh, the example that is given, there's a biblical example of that that is given. Uh, they contrast uh, Paul and uh, Peter. So Paul was sent to the Gentiles, to the non-circumcised, and Peter was sent to the circumcised. And each had their sphere of influence, eh? and this is designated in terms, at least for these authors, in terms of uh, ethnicity. So uh, in the territorial apostleship, you'd have these types of apostles that would be in charge of uh, certain uh, ethnic groups. Now, we saw the vertical apostles with the kind of four types of uh, apostleships. And then we saw the horizontal apostleships with their four categories. Uh, and there's a, another one that is called, and it's funny, you, <laughs> the, name, the term itself is funny, but they use this in the literature, Wagner, Chaitan, and others, uh, hyphenated <laughs> apostles, hy hy half hyphenated apostles. Now, these apostles are people that have more than one uh, calling or more than one office. Um, and there's examples that are, that are given in the literature. We talk about uh, Chuck Pierce or Bill Hammond. Uh, if you remember, I, I talked often about Pierce and Hammond uh, either on, on YouTube or in my uh, Twitter book review. Uh, threads, and um, they are often designated, and they designate themselves, but it seems to have been recognized that these are apostle prophets. You see, so they have, they are apostles, but they, they have a prophetic ministry, and they exercise that ministry with the apostolic ministry. So they're particular. Uh, there are other individuals like C. Peter Wagner, has been recognized as an apostle teacher. And so has Bill Johnson, uh, recognized as also an apostle teacher. And, and these become eventually recognized in the group. Eh? Uh, so these leaders, their leadership become recognized as such. Um, but there's another category, and we won't have time to go in this, and I will be dealing with this uh, next time in my next video. And it's related a lot to the spheres because we haven't even touched on apostolic spheres. You see, there's, a, there's this concept that apostles are 
uh, can only operate according to the sphere uh, in which they have been ordained. And there are biblical references for that that uh, New Apostolic Reformation writers use, and we will look at that next time. But one of those fields uh, and spheres is the marketplace. And next time we will look at that. Uh, marketplace apostles or apostles in the workplace or what we call the church in the workplace. And this is extremely important and it is an important sphere and there are apostles in that sphere that, f and, and this is where we see a lot of uh, some of those mountains. You see the seven, mountain manda seven mountains mandate, uh, apart from the religion one, all the other uh, elements are, you will find them very much present in that sphere. And we will talk about that because apostolic centers will be the place where people will be aligned to apostles. They will find apostolic alignment so that they can operate, be equipped to function in those spheres. This is why apostolic centers uh, exist. This is why uh, apostolic networks e exist. So um, we will look at that next time. We don't have time today. We've covered a lot of ground with apostolic alignment, explaining what it was, explaining the various types of apostles, uh, vertical apostles, horizontal apostles, and hyphenated apostles with all of those uh, various manifestations of apostleship. Next time we will be talking about uh, apostolic spheres and we will be talking about uh, workplace apostles. So once again, thank you very much for taking this time to watch these videos. I hope that you find them useful. If you do, please subscribe to my channel. You can, as usual, share, you can like, you can comment on these videos and I will see you very soon. We will again uh, talk about the importance of religion in the modern world in a couple of days. So thank you very much again and talk to you again very soon.